A priest was approached one night by Satan himself. Do not be frightened, said Satan. I have an offer to make. I will make you tremendously powerful, famous, and rich in return for just one small favor, half your ability to hear. The priest was stunned. Let me think about it for a few days. The next morning, the priest requested to meet the bishop. Your Excellency, I need your advice for a temptation I've been given. He told about his strange encounter. The bishop was shocked. A deal with the devil? Do not do it. It will destroy your soul. But he could see the priest was not convinced. So the bishop arranged a meeting with the archbishop. Your Excellency, this priest has an urgent matter he needs advice about. He told the story. The archbishop responded, First, your hearing is a gift from God. It would be forbidden to sacrifice any part of it. Second, a deal with Satan? Never do it. But the priest wasn't convinced. He was imagining all the wealth, fame, and power he'd receive. So the archbishop requested an audience with the pope. The three of them came into the papal office in great awe. They sat and the archbishop spoke. Your holiness, this priest has a terrible temptation and needs advice. The pope said, sorry, could you speak a little louder, please? Apologies to Pope Francis. We come to the petition in the Lord's Prayer, do not lead us into temptation. Does God lead us into temptation? Does God make people do something wrong? No. The book of James, we read, no one, when tempted, should say, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. We don't need God to lead us into temptation. We can do that all on our own. If God will not lead us into temptation, why do we pray, lead us not into temptation? Why do we ask God to do something that God does not do? Pope Francis said, this lead us in, not into temptation is not a good translation. The French have changed the text with a translation that means, do not let me fall into temptation. I am the one who falls. It is not God who tosses me into temptation in order to see how I fall. A father does not do this. A father helps his child get up right away. The one who leads us into temptation is Satan. I agree with Pope Francis that lead us not into temptation is a poor translation. He suggested do not let us fall into temptation. He addresses the theological problem However, with all due respect to the Pope, it is not an accurate translation of the original Greek in Matthew. Adam Hamilton also sees the problem of praying, lead us not into temptation. He suggests we read it, lead us, comma, not into temptation, but does that really help? Besides, in the Greek original, the negative not comes before the verb and not after it. It literally reads, do not lead us. This suggestion does not solve our problem. However, the majority of the recent and best commentaries provide a simple and accurate answer to the problem. They translate the phrase, do not bring us to the time of trial, or do not put us to the test. Test or trial is a better translation of the Greek word than temptation. Several modern translations of the Bible follow this better rendering of the prayer. So Jesus is inviting us to pray, do not put us to the test, or do not lead us into a trial. There was a very wealthy Texan oil man who had a gorgeous daughter, and he wanted to find her a man who was brave and courageous like himself. He decided to, so to throw a big, a huge Texas style barbecue as a way of meeting some families with handsome young men. It was marvelous. This wealthy Texan had an Olympic-sized swimming pool that he stocked with alligators, crocodiles, and water moccasins. 
After everyone had finished their delicious meal, he called all the eligible young men to the pool area. He told the men that the first one who jumped in and swam to the other end would be given his choice of three things, $1 million in cash, 1,000 acres of his best land, or his daughter's hand in marriage, with her approval, of course. He even mentioned that his daughter was the only heir to his fortune. As soon as he got the last word out of his mouth, there was a loud splash at one end of the pool. A few seconds later, a dripping young man emerged at the other end of the pool. The wealthy Texan said, well, son, it's your choice. Do you want the million in cash? No, sir. Well, how about, how about the land? No, sir. The Texan smiled and said, then I guess you want my daughter to be your wife again. No, sir. Well, son, what do you want? The young man said, I want the name of the person who pushed me into the pool. When we pray, do not put us to the test. Are we asking God not to push us into the pool? The Lord tested Job through terrible trials that the Lord allowed the adversary to do to Job. All his children, nearly all his servants were killed. All his possessions were taken from him. Then he was afflicted from the top of his head to the sole of his feet with boils. His friends came to comfort him, but they turned on him. They accused him of terrible sin, saying that he deserved all this suffering. Job was put through a horrible ordeal. Later in Matthew's gospel, Jesus invited Peter, James, and John to go with him while he prayed in agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was praying not to suffer the ordeal of crucifixion that he was facing, but he was willing to endure it if that's what God wanted. His disciples fell asleep. After praying, Jesus came to his friends and said, what, could none of you stay awake with me for one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may be spared the test. Test, that's the same Greek word as in the Lord's Prayer. What test was Jesus thinking of? He had been praying to be spared the ordeal of crucifixion himself. Jesus was only minutes away from being betrayed by Judas, followed by arrest, torture, trials, and crucifixion the next day. Jesus knew what was coming. Wasn't he saying that the disciples should pray not to be tested by such an ordeal? He did not want his friends to have to suffer what he was going to endure. Why should we pray not to be tested? First, we are human and none of us wants to suffer. Notice that we are praying for us and not me. We pray not only for ourselves, but for our sisters and brothers in Christ, not to experience trials. I think we can pray that for everyone, Christian or not. We naturally want to avoid anything like what Jesus went through, nor would we want that to happen to others. Second, do not put us to the test as a prayer of humility. We know that we may fail. We're asking God not to make it too hard for us because we do not want to disappoint the Lord. We are like the disciples who fell asleep while Jesus struggled in prayer. Jesus said, pray that you may be spared the test, that you may be spared the test. Why? He adds, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Although we have the spirit, we are flesh, and we may flunk the test. So we humbly ask to be spared. And that is why the second half of the verse mirrors the, this plea not to be tested. Deliver us from evil. The word evil can mean anything bad, from an earthquake devastating a town, to a mosquito bite transmitting malaria, to committing adultery. Evil can be a killing flood, cancer, or shoplifting. In this context, we are asking that in difficult times for the Lord to deliver us from evil, save us from having to undergo tragedy, suffering, and heartache. But if it comes, deliver us from it. Deliver us from the evil that others may do to us, from the evil that can happen to people who follow God. During times of persecution, many terrible things have been done to Christians. This is happening in different parts of the world today. And when these trials come, people sometimes give up their faith. 
Reverend Rini Hernandez used to be our district superintendent. He was a pastor in Cuba. He tells about how he was put into a work camp as a young man because he was a Christian. Even though one of the soldiers was going to kill him with a machete, God protected him. He was forced to work for two years at that camp before he was released. But his faith grew stronger as a result of his ordeal. May God deliver us from the evil that others would do to us. We are also praying for God to deliver us from the evil that we may be tempted to do. For example, not to act to get revenge against those who harm us. We are praying that we do not give in to evil ourselves. Scripture teaches us to overcome evil by doing good, not to retaliate against those who may harm us. Deliver us from the evil temptation to strike back. Jesus was faithful throughout his ordeal on the cross even praying for his executioners. But I think the trial or the evil goes beyond persecution to any tragedy or affliction we endure. A rabbi a friend of mine in Plantation, Florida, Rabbi Har, told me about losing his 17-year-old daughter in an auto accident. The grief was devastating. He said the hardest thing for him was not to let go of his faith. When something terrible happens to us, something evil, we question if God is good after all. Because we had lost our son, I understood what Rabbi Har meant. Some of you have gone through that kind of sorrow, having lost children or parents, siblings, spouses, friends. Heartache can drive us away from our faith. It can make us bitter. It's hard to continue to believe in a good God when something tragic happens to us. We've probably all known good Christians who turned their backs on God and never returned to the faith because of losses they experienced. A terrible trial came to the Cunningham household in Elkhart, Kansas in 1916. Floyd Cunningham was stoking the fire of the potbelly stove in the one-room schoolhouse. He thought he was pouring a little kerosene on the coals, but it was gasoline. It exploded and engulfed the entire schoolhouse in fire with Floyd and his seven-year-old brother Glenn inside. The boys managed to get out, but both were severely burned. Glenn later said, I remember screaming and not being able to stop, even when my parents and eventually the doctor arrived. The doctor held out no hope for Floyd. He was too badly burned. He told my parents that I might live unless too much infection set in. If the infection gets too bad, he told mother and father, we won't have any choice but to amputate his legs. If Glenn survived and if they were able to save his legs, he'd probably never walk again. Nine days later, Floyd died. Glenn promised his grieving mother that he would walk again. At first, he scooted a chair around the kitchen. Then he crawled across the yard and pulled himself up on their wooden fence. One stake at a time, he'd pull himself along the fence, trying to hold himself up on his legs day after day. He refused to give up. Two years after the accident, he began to walk. Glenn's favorite Bible verse was, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Eventually, Glenn did mount up with wings like an eagle. Not only did he walk again, but he ran, and he ran fast. They called him the Kansas Flyer because he was so fast on the track team for the University of Kansas. Glenn also competed in the 1500 meters at the 1932 and 1936 Olympics coming in fourth and then second. He set world records for the mile and the 800 meters several times throughout the 1930s. Glenn went on to earn a master's degree and a PhD. He taught at Cornell College for four years, then served in the Navy in World War II. In 1947, he and his wife opened the Glenn Cunningham Youth Ranch. They helped more than 10,000 troubled, abused, neglected, and differently abled children over a, a period of more than 30 years. God had helped Glenn 
get through the ordeal when he was young. So he dedicated himself to helping kids going through difficult times. And that is how God often answers our prayers for deliverance, through the help of a friend. May God help us, and may God not put us to the test, but deliver us from evil. And may the Lord use us to help others who are going through trials. Amen.